In the geographic middle of the state of Kansas, there's an unassuming town of about 40,000 people called Hutchinson. Hutchinson, Kansas, is famous for its salt mines, the Kansas State Fair that it hosts each year, and interestingly, for a museum called the Cosmosphere. When I lived in Wichita, Kansas, I was less than an hour drive from Hutchinson, and I decided, on a whim, to make the drive. The Underground Salt Museum was more enjoyable than you might think a salt museum could be, but the Cosmosphere, to me, was the bell of the ball. The place was originally a planetarium, but it evolved over the years into a sprawling 105,000 square foot facility containing the second largest collection of Soviet and Russian space artifacts outside of Moscow, and the second largest collection of U.S. space artifacts outside of the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. At the Cosmosphere, the story of the space race is told in great detail through signage and dioramas and audio and video experiences, but the legit space artifacts themselves that they have on display are incredible, and there are gobs of them. The tribute models are generally full-size and have some of the same grandeur as the real deal rockets and capsules and equipment, but the actual artifacts. It was amazing seeing some of these things in person. And the authentic piece of space-related memorabilia that stood out most to me in part because it was substantially bigger than I always imagined it being, was the flight-ready backup of the Sputnik 1 satellite. The Sputnik 1 was the first man-made object to orbit Earth. It was launched by the Soviet Union on October 4th, 1957, and it was the emitter of the famous beep heard around the world, because it was up there, in space, orbiting the planet, when nothing had ever done that before. And it was basically just beeping down at the surface of the planet, both to confirm its presence in orbit and to allow its Soviet creators to track it, but also to taunt the Americans, who up until that point were certainly working on similar technologies, but didn't realize just how far behind they were. This simple little satellite, though, made it blindingly obvious just how much catching up they would have to do if they wanted to be taken seriously in terms of space and science technology. The Sputnik 1, more than anything else, represents the throne gauntlet that started the space race. The shape of the Sputnik 1 is fairly well known today because of its presence in popular culture. It's a metal sphere, basically, with four leg-like antenna jutting out the back end, all equidistant from each other. It's a beautifully simple object, but I didn't realize till I saw that real deal backup version, which very well could have found itself up in orbit had the first version failed or detonated on the rocket on the way up into space. But I didn't realize how big it was. I'd always pictured this cute little toy, when in reality, the sphere is almost two feet, or about 57 centimeters in diameter, and the antenna are each 2.4 meters, or nearly 8 feet long. It's big. It's much bigger than I assumed. But this isn't uncommon when it comes to satellites and probes and similar technologies. The way these tools are portrayed in media often show them against backdrops that offer very little or no scale. Sputnik on a rocket or up in space gives us very little to go on because rockets can be a variety of sizes and space is an abyss lacking much in the way of useful visual yardsticks. Likewise, the Curiosity rover that the United States landed on Mars in August of 2012, and which was only expected to last two years but which is still alive and kicking today, over five years later, is often portrayed as a cute, eager to please, and sometimes quite lonely creature. What many of us fail to realize is that the Curiosity rover is also quite big. It weighs almost 900 kilograms, which is nearly 2,000 pounds, 
It is nine and a half feet long, almost nine feet wide, and over seven feet tall, or 2.9 by 2.7 by 2.2 meters. It's not as long as an SUV, but it's wider, and it weighs more than 10 average adult men put together. But again, when we picture it, when I picture it even, knowing that it's a big machine intellectually, I still tend to think of it as a precocious and cute little robot, like something that's scampering around another planet, rather than lumbering around it like some kind of laser-wielding death machine. And yes, it does have lasers for vaporizing rocks and testing their composition. And this perception is in part due to our propensity to personify, or in the case of our machines, to animalize these devices to make them seem more like beloved pets than machines. The Curiosity Rover, due to its shape, its name, and its wally like tenacity, feels cute and loyal to us humans. It's also portrayed in its social media accounts and other media platforms as delightful and fun. The rover takes selfies. It's just like us. It putters around slowly, exploring the Martian landscape, shooting tiny lasers, pew pew pew, and it has a little camera head that pivots around on a long neck. It's adorable. It's a happy little robot friend mapping out a planet-sized wasteland. It's comforting and appealing in an environment where very few things can be described that way. Part of this impression is just the nature of humans and how we tend to view our robotic or robot-seeming creations. But part of it is the result of very intentional efforts by, in the case of the Curiosity, the United States scientific community and NASA more specifically, and in the case of the Sputnik 1, the broader worldwide scientific community. Because at the end of the day, these satellites and rovers and probes and vessels are just means of exploring the unexplored, of learning about all kinds of things that are difficult to quantify. They are part of a larger effort to expand the reach of science education, but also to increase overall scientific literacy and enthusiasm about science. If we can't get funding for these types of projects, we cannot do that type of exploration, and we remain ignorant. And though there are a lot of numerically significant reasons to always be exploring and learning more about these big questions, those rationales don't always translate into soundbite-friendly or politically viable arguments, which is a shame because as a result of that, the myriad scientific communities consistently find themselves needing to win the hearts and minds of the wider population rather than just their peers who are likewise doing such research, and rather than just those who are holding the purse strings too, the politicians who fund a lot of the research being done. So these groups need to convince essentially everyone, not just the scientists, not just the politicians, but the people. And the people is a very big demographic to try to reach out to and to appeal to as well. We toiling masses already have enough to worry about without adding the expansion of the solar system or the composition of moon-based cryogeysers to our plates. Thank you very much. It's very difficult for anyone to spare an additional thought for this type of topic. And making the reaching of people who are otherwise engaged with this type of information a requirement, an existential requirement for your organization, it is a whole lot to ask. And that's what I want to talk about today. Research and observation, how such projects are presented to the public, and the upsides and downsides of the ways that we fund these types of endeavors. You are listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Note Things is an independent, listener-supported show. There are many different ways that you can help support this show if you are liking what you hear. A full list of them can be found at letsnotethings.com slash contribute. And one of the simpler ways to contribute monetarily is to pop by the Let's Note Things Patreon at patreon.com slash letsnotethings. 
It's also very easy to help support the show non-monetarily. Leaving a review up on iTunes only takes a moment and helps a whole lot more than you would think. And it's also super valuable if you share the show with a friend who you think might enjoy it or with your social network of choice. Any and all contributions of any kind are super appreciated. Thank you very much to everyone who's already contributed in some way, and thanks in advance if you are considering doing so. Another great way to help support the show is to check out our sponsors, the first of which today is Audible. If you enjoy podcasts and have not yet gotten into audiobooks, I highly recommend it. I was a holdout for a while. I enjoy more standard books that I consume using my eyeballs, but audiobooks have found a niche in my life and they fulfill their purpose incredibly well. If you'd like to give it a shot without investing a cent, you can go to audibletrial.com LKT. And that will net you a free 30-day trial of Audible and a free audiobook of your choice. Any audiobook from their massive collection. If you are lacking inspiration as to what you might spend that credit on, stick around till the end of this episode and I will give a book recommendation. And the other sponsor today is Everlane, my favorite clothing company. I was very excited to see that they started making denim recently. So I ordered a pair of jeans. I am eagerly anticipating their arrival. If they are of the same caliber and quality of their other clothes, though, I am certain I won't be disappointed. If you'd like to check out Everlane's catalog, go to letsnotethings.com slash Everlane. If you end up buying something, I will receive a commission for that sale. It won't cost you anything extra, but it's a great way to both potentially fill a gap in your wardrobe and help support this podcast. That's letsnotethings.com slash Everlane. All right, let's get back to the show. The article that I want to start with today comes from the Washington Post, and it's entitled... How to Steer a Spacecraft into Saturn. This article presents an overview of the cassini Huygens mission, a collaboration mainly between NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Italian Space Agency, the three of which built the components for the mission, the actual physical device, but which also involved the efforts of teams in 17 countries to help design, build, fly, and collect data from the cassini Huygens craft. And though it's commonly called Cassini today, this project still officially has the same name that it started out with, that of cassini Huygens. though the reason for the common shorter name usage will become apparent in just a moment. Cassini is the name of the orbiter portion of the craft, meaning it is the part of the ship that remains forever in orbit, circling around planets and jaunting around the solar system. The Huygens is a lander that was designed to be released from the larger Cassini craft so that it could land on the Saturn moon Titan. And this mission, like most space missions, required quite the build-up period to get going, and then eventually, finally, blast off, and then even more time to finally arrive at its destination. It was initially conceived of and mapped out in 1982. It was then launched in 1997, 15 years later. It finally arrived at Saturn, entering orbit around the massive ringed gas giant in July of 2004, That's about seven years of transit through space, and its maximum speed was 44 kilometers per second, which is 98,346 miles per hour. So at somewhere in the neighborhood of that speed, it took seven years to arrive at Saturn. Just in case the distances involved here were not clear, Saturn is a very long way from Earth. So the intention here was for Cassini to orbit Saturn, the first probe ever to do so, though there have been three other probes previously that have swept by the planet more distantly without entering orbit. But it was also vital to have the Huygens lander essentially catch a ride with the probe to the Saturn system so that it could get to Titan, one of Saturn's moons, and land there. The first human craft ever to do so, and in fact, the first human craft ever 
to land anywhere in the outer solar system. But even before it arrived in the Saturn system, the Cassini-Huygens was able to get a whole lot accomplished. The initial launch made use of what's called a gravitational assist trajectory, which means the craft was launched in the direction of Venus, coming up behind the planet, and it used Venus's gravity to pull it along and build up momentum, slingshotting it further, faster, than would have otherwise been feasible. So right off the bat, it flew by Venus twice, did a pass back by Earth, and got some excellent photos of the moon in 1999 when it cruised by, heading outward away from the inner solar system as a result of that speed boost from Venus. At the beginning of the year 2000, the Cassini-Huygens snapped photos of asteroid 2685 Mazursky as it passed close by. Then, at the end of that same year, it got close to Jupiter and sent back the most high-resolution color portrait of the planet ever produced. You can actually make out details as small as 37 miles wide, or 60 kilometers across, which, on a planet that big, with 2.5 times the mass of all the other planets in the solar system combined, with a volume that would allow 1,321 Earths to fit inside? That's really saying something. It was quite the photo opportunity and quite an excellent photo. In 2003, the Cassini team was able to test Einstein's theory of gravity using radio signals from the probe, something that wouldn't have been possible without an object with the right equipment out in space at that distance. And it wouldn't have been possible had the object not been at the right place in space, allowing its radio signals to pass near the sun and the sun's gravity. The test, it turned out, supported Einstein's theory, and it improved the resolution to which we could confirm his theory from one part in 1,000 to about 20 parts in 1 million. So we could say after that test with a much greater certainty that Einstein's theory was correct. In 2004, the photos from Saturn began to roll in, alongside the data from the craft's numerous other scientific tools. It completed its objectives the following years, which included figuring out the 3D structure and dynamic behavior of Saturn's rings, determining what the surfaces of the moons around Saturn were made out of, and what their geologic history might be, assessing the nature and origin of a dark material that was previously observed on Iepetus's leading hemisphere, basically sorting out what some weird non-reflective stuff on one of Saturn's moons might be, measuring the structure and behavior of Saturn's magnetosphere and its atmosphere at cloud level, studying the time variability of Titan's clouds and hazes, Titan being another one of Saturn's moons, and characterizing Titan's surfaces regionally, essentially mapping it out and dividing it into regions, kind of like we do on Earth, based on our deserts, mountains, rivers, and other features. It accomplished all of this, and it also landed the Huygens probe on Titan. And the photos derived from that landing are amazing, especially when you think about how far away this thing is, and how truly alien the land upon which it took those photos is from that of Earth. The moon of a gas giant, which out there in the solar system, is kind of like a small planet around a star, one of dozens of such small planets. And its star is, in this case, a massive ringed gas planet. And there's another star, our sun, off in the distance. And this moon, this tiny planet really, because I mean, it's actually bigger than Mercury, has a dense atmosphere and stable bodies of surface water. The only place in the solar system beyond Earth, that we know of so far anyway, that has these features. There is weather on Titan, wind and rain, though the water cycle there is not made up of H2O water, but rather liquid hydrocarbons that form lakes, while the atmosphere is mostly nitrogen with a few extra components that cause methane and ethane clouds to form high up in the atmosphere, while a nitrogen-heavy smog rests down below at ground level. We know all of this because of Huygens. Without it, Titan would be like Venus was before the Soviets started landing probes there. 
the cloud cover is just too dense for us to derive much useful information from afar. It would have remained a complete mystery other than being highly reflective when viewed from a distance because of that thick atmosphere. In addition to those big Saturn and Titan related goals, and alongside the flybys of Venus, Earth, our Moon, the aforementioned asteroid, and Jupiter, Cassini also flew by the moons Thea, Iepetus, Dione, Tethys, Enceladus, Mimas, Hyperion, Phoebe, Janus, Epimetheus, Prometheus, Pandora, Helene, Atlas, Pan, Telesto, Calypso, and Methany. Cassini's flyby of Enceladus was particularly exciting, as it was able to pass through one of the moon's plumes, which is a cloud of gas and particles shot into space by geysers that cover the moon. So just like geysers here on Earth, Enceladus has geysers that shoot something into space, and we wanted to find out what that something was. Passing through that plume allowed the craft's sensors to detect water, carbon dioxide, and various hydrocarbons, while at the same time it was able to detect warmer than usual spots on the moon, indicating that there are not only ingredients for life present down there, but also quite likely some kind of active geologic activity underneath the surface of the moon. It also discovered, based on a reading from a later flyby, that its surface is not attached to its core. Gravitational and imaging data supported the assertion that the underground ocean we have long suspected is just underneath its surface is quite likely global. So Enceladus is a moon with a core, and that core is covered with a moon-sized ocean. It covers the entire tiny planet, and within that ocean, there are ingredients for life and some kind of heat source. And on the outside of that ocean, like the candy shell of an M&M, there is a crust of frozen material, through which these geysers periodically poke out and send up these plumes. Pretty damn cool that we could confirm that. This data has made that particular moon a very, very tempting target for future exploratory missions, as a location that could possibly harbor life of some kind, or which may have harbored life at some point in its history. Seven new moons of Saturn were also discovered by this mission. Methany, Pallini, Polydeuces, Daphnis, Anthe, Aegean, and another that has yet to receive a formal name, but which is currently being called S-2009-S1. And though that may seem like a lot of accomplishments for just a single mission, that's still just a very broad overview of what the Cassini-Huygens program was able to accomplish. A lot happened on this mission, enough that NASA was able to get permission to keep it going, even after its 2008 end date, at which point it had done everything it had set out to do and more. They got permission first to extend its life out to 2010, which allowed them to study the Saturn system during its equinox, and after that it was extended another six and a half years until September of 2017. That second extension allowed for another 155 revolutions around Saturn, 54 more flybys of Titan, the planet moon, and 11 more flybys of Enceladus, the geyser moon. The total cost of all of this, the entire mission, was the bargain basement price of about $3.26 billion. That figure doesn't include some additional costs, like the effects of inflation over the course of the mission, and additional expenses due to the mission lasting so much longer than planned. But still, that's about one-tenth of what the U.S. spent on the Afghanistan war, separate from any other conflict in 2016 alone. These are not exactly comparable budgets, I know, but it puts things in perspective. A lot of bang for our buck in this mission, which gave us two decades worth of textbook changing data from the outer solar system for a very, very reasonable price. But the fuel in the spacecraft is now running low. They are not positive how low, because a fuel gauge was not a standard device to have installed on a spacecraft when they launched this one back in the day. But it's low, and they wanted to make sure that they sent 
this little guy off in a blaze of glory, allowing Cassini, which is now just Cassini because Huygens is down there on Titan, to continue to do science until its very last moment. And that's why the Cassini will be hurling itself into Saturn on September 15th, 2017. As it plummets into the crushing gravity of the gas giant, it'll struggle to keep its antenna pointed towards Earth for as long as it's able, so it can continue to send back as much valuable data as possible, for as long as possible, before it finally dies, crushed into particles by a gas giant. Now, Cassini will be dead by the time this episode is published, but I'm recording it a few days before that final moment, and as of now, NASA is pulling out all the stops for what they're calling the grand finale phase of the Cassini-Huygens mission. There's a website with a countdown to that final moment, building up the anticipation of our final goodbye, though everyone involved with the mission is acutely aware that there will be a time lag between the probe dying and its final message reaching us here on Earth. It'll take about 83 minutes for that information to travel at light speed from Saturn to Earth. A yawning gulf of nothingness between us and our charming little orbiter that could. And it's been fun to see this mission get so much well-deserved attention of late, though I know that part of the rationale for banging the drum so loudly is to ensure that NASA continues to get the budget it needs to operate in the future. They absolutely want to inspire people about the world of scientific inquiry and about space as a frontier to explore, but part of every social media effort and fancy website with a countdown and every reference to the probe as a cute animal, a loyal Sputnik or Curiosity rover-like pet, must be in some way partially informed by the financial reality that backs this sort of mission. $3.26 billion and change does not come easy, and that goes double for a government agency. For some additional context, it's worth knowing that in its early days, the Cassini-Huygens project twice came close to death, in the sense of being cancelled, not in the sense of being crushed by the gravity of a gas giant. Both near-death experiences were political in nature, and stemmed from the same bad press that itself stemmed from incorrect information wielded by media-savvy activists who managed to sway the opinions of scandal-wary politicians who held the purse strings for the mission. Part of the original rationale for selecting the Cassini-Huygens mission instead of one of the other potential options that had been mapped out and offered up was that it was a collaboration between NASA and the European space programs, which would provide these groups the opportunity to reinforce their working relationship. There was a widespread perception that NASA had not treated the other groups like equals during prior collaborations. And at this point, in the late 80s, there was an urgent desire to make sure they all felt good about each other and felt they were getting appropriate fanfare and respect. And that makes sense for many reasons, but especially if you think about the political context surrounding them at the time, namely the slow-moving disaster that would soon lead to the dissolution of the Soviet Union, but also leading up to that, the increased collaboration that had been occurring between the Soviet space program and the European space programs. The U.S. wanted to make sure their NATO nation relationships were as tight-knit as possible right about then. It was this tightening of the knit of those relationships that allowed the Cassini-Huygens program to survive its aforementioned political near-death experiences. In both 1992 and 1994, the U.S. Congress wanted to cancel the program because of some very ill-informed activists who believed the plutonium fuel source within Cassini could be a threat to the environment. The argument made by these protesters was that the plutonium fuel pellet that powered the craft could become a danger to the civilian population. Specifically, they latched on to data released by NASA about a worst-case scenario that could conceivably occur when the Cassini-Huygens swept past Earth after looping around Venus for its speed boost. The probe could possibly, maybe, hit the atmosphere of Earth 
and hit it at the exact right angle so that it not only burnt up but also degraded in a very specific way that allowed the plutonium to also degrade and then scatter as dust into the atmosphere and spread around parts of the planet. And this, the data showed, could maybe increase the chances of around 5,000 people getting cancer at some point in their lives due to the slight uptake of what amounted to radioactive fallout in the air. These activists, firstly, misread the data, intentionally or unintentionally, believing that the figures given represented a risk to 500,000 people, not 5,000. But the chances of that kind of event happening in the first place were so astronomical that they might as well have been protesting the takeoff of every passenger plane from every airport in the country, because there was an off chance that one of those planes could crash into a nuclear power plant and release radioactive material into the environment. It was, mathematically, a non-issue. It was one that needed to be presented as part of the project's initial research, because they are incredibly thorough, but not a real thing that any informed person would actually worry about. But these protesters, well-meaning as they no doubt were, were also immune to facts and perspectives that deviated from what they had decided to shout about, which amounted to, oh my god, nuclear thing, scared, 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 do something. That got them a lot of press. It's almost always easier to fearmonger than explain complex math via the press, after all. And this led to a lot of politicians taking the side of the Vox Populi. They didn't want to seem out of touch with the common man, after all. Now, I respect people who act to make changes in areas that they see as problematic in the world. And I respect politicians listening to their constituents and actually acting to address their concerns. What sucks is when ignorant people try to make their ignorant political representatives, ignorant about subjects here, not ignorant in general, kill off a safe and wonderful project that might allow us to understand the universe better. So in case my bias isn't clear already, I think the protesters in this case were somewhat similar to anti-vaxxers today. Well-meaning, but unfortunately very misinformed, and the politicians were making bad choices as a result of pressure from this particularly vocal group. But although there was this pressure to cancel the program for stupid reasons, the relationships between the US and Europe saved the day. In both years that the project was challenged, NASA was able to convince Congress that it wouldn't be a very good idea to cancel a project that both the US and the European space agencies had invested so much time and resources into because that could influence the country's relationships elsewhere, perhaps weakening our friendship at the very early days of a new world order, just after the Soviet Union collapsed and we needed those relationships to be ironclad. The story of the Cassini-Huygens mission is interesting to me for many different reasons, in part because, as I said, it's going to end just a few days after I record this. We are crashing it into Saturn, so that we can send it off in a spectacular fashion while also getting a little more data from it, but also because destroying the equipment in this way keeps the craft from maybe accidentally at some point floating around and contaminating one of Saturn's moons, which could possibly contain some kind of microbial or other life. We don't want to accidentally commit xenocide by introducing a stowaway virus or something like that to Titan, for instance. And there's a small chance that the probe could, if it runs out of fuel and dies while floating around, it could crash into one of these moons someday. So it's prudent to destroy it in Saturn and be sure that that doesn't happen. But it's also interesting because you can see in this project the evolution of NASA, and you can see some of its slow but steady pivot to face the public more directly. Now, NASA has never been entirely closed off. Even from its very early days, it served as a public face for many high sciences and technologies, demonstrating U.S. superiority in this or that, giving us a war of a sort to fight that wasn't an actual war. That was more of a knowledge-based foot race toward new discoveries and accomplishments. It was kind of like our Olympic team in the international 
long jump competition towards space. The Apollo program received a great deal of press, arriving as it did at the dawning of a moment in time in which most Americans owned or had access to a television. And the organization's work on Skylab, the first and only space station independently built by the United States, which stayed in orbit from 1973 until 1974, prepared NASA in terms of promoting to the public the benefits of such programs, which paid off when they refocused their time and attention on the space shuttle program, which began around the same time as Skylab in the early 70s and continued until it was canceled, the final shuttle decommissioned in 2011. The International Space Station, however, arguably, has become the golden child of the space news spotlight in the years since its first module was launched in 1998. And the ISS is pretty cool when you think about it. In terms of the science being done aboard what amounts to a massive habitable satellite, but also in terms of what the International Space Station represents. It is, as should be obvious by its name, international. It's a joint project of five space agencies, including NASA, Roscosmos, the Russian space agency, JAXA, the Japanese space agency, ESA, the European space agency, and CSA, the Canadian space agency. It is the longest continuous human presence in low Earth orbit, and it is the ninth space station to have been occupied by crews. Some of these in the past were very short-lived, while others, like the Russian Mir station, stayed up in orbit much longer. Mir held the previous record for longest occupied station at 9 years, 357 days. The ISS is now the record holder. It will have been occupied continuously by crew for 17 years on November 2nd, 2017. Part of the purpose of the ISS is education and cultural outreach. What this means in practice is that the astronauts aboard continuously run experiments, those developed by NASA and other space agencies, those developed by technological or scientific interests, and those developed by students down on Earth, which then allows the astronauts to interact with those students via video chat to show those kids how the experiments they designed are holding up in space. Increasingly, these space station-based astronauts are also taking photos meant for sharing on social media. They tweet and otherwise interact with followers on Twitter and Instagram and share their passion for science via interviews, blog posts, and other popular communication channels. Commander Chris Hadfield, the first Canadian astronaut to perform a spacewalk, is a great example of an astronaut who has gone the extra mile in this particular aspect of an astronaut's job. He shot a music video in the space station in 2013, in which he covered David Bowie's Space Oddity. It was the first music video to be shot in space, and it was tons of fun and gained a lot of positive press for the ISS, for space research, and for Canada. It was a terrific example of why these types of cultural outreach programs are so valuable. Now that said, there are some valid concerns about research money and how it's earned and how it's spent. I mean, there are valid concerns about how any government agency spends its money, since the money comes from tax dollars, but NASA in particular, with its directive to spread its message widely and educate the public about certain things, with them it's amplified a little bit, because we see more of this agency than we tend to see of other government agencies. Like, for instance, the Army. We see more of NASA in the press and across social media. The U.S. Army has PR people, and it even has social media accounts. It has just under 900,000 followers on Instagram. And for an account that's largely PR material with photos attached, that's not bad. But NASA has taken to social media as a channel to reach its audience and fulfill its cultural expansion and education-based directive. And in the past few years, that has meant upping the ante on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat and anywhere else you might think to look. They have around 500 social media accounts in total across all these different networks and for their different subsections of their organization. And they're doing really well. They've won 
many awards for their efforts on social media, and their Instagram page is doing a whole lot better than the Army's Instagram page. They have over 27 million followers, compared to the aforementioned less than 900,000. And all that exposure is great, but it's also concerning for some, because again, tax dollars. Isn't NASA supposed to be out exploring space? How much of their budget are they spending on these inessential tasks? Things that, from a certain point of view, can seem a bit like just rampant self-promotion, and maybe even a cynical effort to gain more funding from the government next year by stirring up public enthusiasm for their projects, rather than spending that money on actually doing their job. This is similar, this concern, in a way, to the issues that many people have had with non-governmental nonprofits like the Red Cross lately. There have been multiple scandals involving the organization, some of which have involved cases of people within the organization doing horrible things, abusing those that they're supposed to be helping. But in other cases, it's been something more fundamental, maybe the way that they spend their money. Big, sprawling bureaucracies require a great deal of money to operate, and the percentage of money going to keeping that machine going seemed to be growing and growing, and folks who were donating to the Red Cross, hoping that their dollars would go to help someone in need somewhere, came to learn that a great deal of their contribution was instead being used to help pay for what seemed like bloated operating costs for an overly complex bureaucracy rather than going to the intended people in need. There are a lot of facets to that type of story, of course, as more complex systems can sometimes be better than smaller, nimbler systems that cost less to maintain, but which are also often less capable in terms of sheer oomph and overarching capabilities. But that's the same type of concern that could be applied to NASA, where you might look at all the press they get and all their social media activity and think that something isn't adding up. Are they draining the solar system exploration coffers to get more Instagram followers, which in turn might help them get more funding, which they can then put into more self-promotion? As it turns out, no, not really. They actually make a whole lot out of very little within their PR and social media department. The entirety of their education efforts amounted to just under $90 million in 2016, and that's out of a $19.3 billion budget. So education is already a very, very small slice of the overall NASA pie. Most of their funds are spent on upkeep, for existing infrastructure like the ISS and numerous satellites and for new missions like the Cassini-Huygens. And of that 90 million earmarked for education, the vast majority of that is spent on numerous grant programs and the funding of STEM-related education programs for schools rather than anything that they do in-house. The social media wing of the NASA PR department, in fact, is very quickly becoming famous for the very unusual way in which they operate. They have no budget at all, except for the salaries of the people who work there. So they have some employees, but they do not spend money on Facebook ads or other promotions. All of their growth is organic. They produce good content, and they get creative, tweeting from the perspective of the Curiosity rover, and posting photos of a purple nebula on the day that Prince died. And that allows them to grow like crazy. They stay relevant. They make science and their missions relevant. But they don't dig into the typical branding toolkit to do it, meaning that they do not throw money at the problem and use that to artificially inflate their brand or their numbers. Which is great. I'm very impressed by that. I honestly wasn't sure what to expect when I started looking into this for this episode, and I suspected that they had not only a substantial team, but also a decent chunk of change to invest in outreach that they could then put under the header of education, that they could spend on Facebook ads and they could say, yeah, we're educating the world about space. But no, it turns out that their team is small and their budget is literally zero and they're just good at what they do. So kudos for that, NASA. 
and the skillful use of their mediums is no doubt at least partially the result of necessity. They simply did not have the option to have a bigger budget, so it was kind of get good at things and be creative or remain small and a blip on the cultural radar. You could either do your job well or completely fail to do your job, which would then render your organization that you believe in somewhat irrelevant in public discourse. I don't know if the decision to animalize their spacecraft is an intentional choice or not. As I mentioned, they do tweet from the first-person perspective of their Curiosity rover. A recent tweet, as of the day I'm recording this, shows a photo from the rover's camera of a view over the edge of a ridge that it climbed on Mars. The tweet reads, Started from the bottom, now I'm here. Scouting Vera Rubin Ridge on hashtag Mars. And that's a great tweet. It's interesting. It's culturally aware. It's clever. It's fun. And it has a photo from Mars taken by a remotely controlled robot. And it makes us attach all of those attributes to the rover itself and to the mission itself and to the agency itself. This is that rover that I mentioned before that is massive. It's a behemoth. But we perceive it to be small and cute because of activities like this, because of how well it tweets and how culturally relevant it seems. But it may never have been a conscious choice to give this thing and other spacecraft a personality. It may just have evolved that way, the same way that our love for our phones or our cars or other non-human technology tends to evolve. We, over time, fill their actions and machine tendencies and random glitches with conscious intention, and we trick ourselves into loving them. But either way, it does seem to be a boon for NASA that we tend to animize their creations in this way. Now, all that praise for NASA and their efforts aside, I do share a concern that is fairly well elucidated in a Wired article from 2015 that's entitled, NASA's Social Media Strategy is Genius and Kind of Maddening. And in that article, the author waxes poetic about the cleverness and capability and accomplishments of the NASA social media team, but then goes on to complain that NASA granted a sneak peek of one of the defining space photos of the last several years, a crystal clear image of Pluto taken as the New Horizons spacecraft cruised by on its way out of the solar system that same year. You've almost certainly seen this photo. If you haven't already, I will link to it in the show notes. It is gorgeous. So the idea was to tease the image to the public, and that meant posting a lower resolution format of it somewhere on social media so that the high-res version could then be released on schedule through the proper channels. So they posted that lower resolution version on Instagram an hour before it was seen anywhere else on the planet. Now that's a clever promotional action, but the problem here, the author of this article, explains, is that there are issues that arise when government agencies favor one company over any other company. They're not supposed to do that legally. And though this doesn't seem to have been the intention here to favor Instagram and its parent company, Facebook, in any particular way, posting a history-making photo to Instagram before any other location gave Instagram a window of exclusivity that favored them with massive amounts of traffic. And so it was beneficial to NASA as an agency because it brought in traffic to their page and got it new followers on social media, brought attention to the information that they're trying to disseminate. But it was also problematic because they did, in a way, use tax dollars to help Facebook benefit financially. And that's a no-no. These types of issues will be increasingly common, I think, as agencies like NASA turn to face the public ever more squarely, in part to ensure that they fulfill their mission to educate the public and to share what they've done, but also to ensure that their funding is assured and that they are part of the conversation so that politicians will be more inclined to grant them the budgets that they request each year so that they can continue to do the work that they do. 
Now, NASA does seem to be pretty above board with things like this, at least as far as I can tell, and especially compared to some other agencies. Any favoring that may have taken place seems to have been an accidental byproduct, not a conscious collaboration with Facebook or anyone else. But this ever-present possibility of this type of corporate entanglement with a government agency will become even more pronounced, I think, as this new space race that we're entering, one that is increasingly shaped by private companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic, as that continues to take off and replace some of the other infrastructure that we've relied on over the years, it will become increasingly difficult for NASA to make sure that they are balancing their coverage and to ensure that they're not giving too much press to one private company over another. And that, of course, becomes difficult as they simply try to report on what's happening. This rocket was launched to go to the ISS, and if it happened to be a SpaceX rocket, that is valuable information. And yet, it could be construed as favoring one private company over another in the same way of their accidentally favoring Instagram with that Pluto photo. And what we have when these private companies are aerospace companies in particular is the chance that NASA could accidentally grant favor to one company over another, boosting that company's credibility, which then in turn allows them, because of that increased credibility, to get more contracts with the government. So in an indirect way, social media exposure or any kind of press put out by an agency like this could accidentally create a flywheel that would over time continue to add to a private company's coffers without their intending to. And it could be very beneficial to do that too. It doesn't necessarily mean that this is a bad thing in every single way, but it would be a bad thing in terms of the legalities of agencies spending tax dollars to favor one non-governmental entity over another. So the balancing of the needs of a space industry that is evolving into something that is far more multifaceted than before, and the needs to maintain a certain governmental neutrality, that is going to be an increasing concern for NASA in the coming years. And hopefully they'll be able to manage it. I'm sure there will be more missteps along the way, but I am willing to bet there will also be at least one or two major screw-ups that lead to some insanely negative press to go along with all of the good press that they've garnered over the years. It is a brave new world out there when it comes to this kind of industry. There's a lot of money involved, and most of that money is wielded by these new entrants into the field, the private companies, while the regulating bodies like NASA are being squeezed by budget cuts at a time when their oversight, but also their ability to communicate clearly has never been more necessary. They've never been more capable of it, but it's also never been more precarious in a way because of the potential for accidental oversteps, but also because it is a brave new world and we don't know where the lines are drawn quite yet. It'll be interesting to see where we land in how we balance the downsides and the benefits of different hybrid approaches that are available when it comes to accomplishing our goals in space but also in countless other frontiers that we are exploring. Our deep sea expeditions, our massive particle accelerators, our explorations of our own minds. The knowledge gleaned from these sorts of expeditions have the potential to increase our collective human capacity and capability manyfold, but only if we do them right. Only if we acquire and disseminate information in a way that evolves our current systems rather than solidifying them and amplifying the existing problems and inequalities. It may be that depending on government entities to do such research is the wrong approach to begin with if we want to grow and change for the better. And it may be that allowing corporations to conduct a land grab in space, for instance, mining all nearby asteroids and claiming portions of Mars before anyone else can get there, is the wrong approach. Either one of these approaches could either be the thing that helps us get out there faster to create a better version of what we have today, a more evolved society, or it may be that they are exactly the opposite. They enshrine the bad stuff that we have today 
and perpetuate it far into the future, well beyond what we might have hoped. I don't think that there's any way to predict which approach, which extreme or which spot somewhere in the middle of that spectrum will be ideal in any given instance for any particular field, for any particular frontier. But I like to think that an awareness of this precarious balance can at least help us nudge these systems away from harmful extremes as we feel our way blindly through the unknown toward all the things that we hope to find there. If you are enjoying Let's Know Things, consider popping by iTunes, or I guess it's called Apple Podcasts now, and leaving a review. This is a super easy and quick and free way to help support the show if you are keen to do so. Another great way to help support this podcast is by sharing it with your friends, with your social network of choice, and you can also contribute directly in a multitude of ways. You can do so via PayPal or Venmo. You can do so via Patreon. If you go to patreon.com slash let's know things, there you will also get an ad-free version of this show and access to all the discussions and such that take place there. Any and all methods of support are super appreciated. Thank you so much, everyone who has already contributed in some way already, and thank you in advance if you are considering doing so in the future. Another great way to help support the show is to check out our sponsors, the first of which today is Everlane, my favorite clothing company. Everlane sells really well-made basics, basically, things that are made to not go out of style and to go with pretty much everything. It's made well and fits very well with the idea of having less of better, but it's still very reasonably priced because of their business model. I have tons of clothes from Everlane. I have some bags from them as well. Everything I have from their catalog, I really love and enjoy. And I would never encourage you to buy anything that you don't need, but if you do currently have a gap in your wardrobe, consider visiting them by going to letsnotethings.com slash Everlane. That will take you to their catalog, their normal page, and it will ensure that anything that you buy, I will get a commission for. So it won't cost you anything more, but it's a great way to get some wonderful clothing or maybe a bag while also helping to support this show. Let's know things.com slash Everlane. And the other sponsor today is Audible. If you go to audibletrial.com slash LKT, you will receive a free 30-day trial of Audible and a free audiobook of your choice from their massive collection. And this can be any audiobook at all. It can be a book from your to-do list. They almost certainly have it in their catalog. It can be one of my books if you're interested in reading something that I've written via the audiobook medium. Or if you're keen, you can pick up the book Bombs Away by Harry Turtledove. Bombs Away is the first of three. I think it might end as a trilogy, but there might be another book. They kind of left an opening for it. But it's a trilogy by Harry Turtledove, who is known as the master of alternate history. And the concept of this series is that during the Korean War, when the North Koreans surged into South Korea and China was helping them out, there was a moment in time in history where Harry Truman was thinking about using atomic bombs to defeat the Chinese and their North Korean allies. In real life, he did not do this. He did not take the advice of his general, and he did not drop atomic bombs, and that led to the world that we live in today. In this series, he uses atomic bombs, and the trilogy, I just finished the last one, which is called Armistice, the other day. This trilogy is basically what happens next. What happens when essentially a new atomic world war breaks out just after the end of World War II? And Harry Turtledove is a history geek and a half. He is very good at integrating actual historical figures into these stories, and he does a great deal of research. It's impressive. I've learned as much about history, actual history, from some of his books as I have from any textbook on the matter, because the details are all true and correct. All he's done is changed one thing and predicted what might have happened. So it's Unfortunately, somewhat topical now in the age of a nuclear North Korea, but it's also a wonderful piece of historical fiction, the Hot War Trilogy, and the first book is Bombs Away by Harry Turtledove. 
if you're looking for a relatively easy read that happens to be about a fairly disturbing topic. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find my blog at exilelifestyle.com. And you can find the show notes for this episode and every episode of the podcast at letsnotethings.com. You can find me on pretty much every social network at Colin is my name, or I'm just Colin Wright on Facebook. Feel free to reach out and say hello. Thank you so much for listening. I am Colin Wright, and I will talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.